was so beautiful. Ooh. All right, today we have asked Josh to sit in chair for 15 minutes. There it is getting more strength. Hey, I'm Josh. I'm an addict and an alcoholic. Hey, Josh. <clears throat> um, I was told to stand by my sponsor whenever I spoke. I didn't take that advice for a long time, and then one day it just clicked, and I did it, and it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Um, you know, a little bit about me. I have a sponsor, a step working sponsor in this program. He has a sponsor. Uh, my sobriety date is January 11, 2015. Um, the program saved my life. Uh, I wouldn't be here. I'm, it's such an honor to be up here, and I want to thank Brian for asking me to come in and uh, check out the meeting and, and share, because um, this is really important to me. This is a way my sponsor told me of giving back. It's one of many ways that I can show my gratitude, not just talk about how grateful I am. You know, show my gratitude for the fact that I'm alive today. Um, because when it comes down to it, and I'm in a spiritual mindset, and I'm doing spiritual things, um, you know, I can see that I was very much on my way to a place of death uh, or incarceration, which, thank God, didn't happen to me. Um, so, you know, I'd like to share <laughs> something I think anyone could relate to. Um, this is just my opinion, is that um, I experienced a lot of suffering. And I think that's something everyone in this room can relate to. Um, I knew suffering long before I knew alcohol, before I knew drugs, um, you know, before I even discovered that stuff. You know, I could go back to my childhood, and I used to cry myself to sleep at night because something didn't feel right. I felt very alone in this world. And I was afraid to lay down with, with just myself and my thoughts, and even at a young age. And I used to wake up having night terrors and something didn't feel right. And, um, you know, that, that's how I grew up. Uh, big, big things that happened to me, you know, I had a pretty good childhood. I, I can't say too many bad things about it. But when I was 10 years old, I was in fourth grade. My father was a physician prescribing himself medications. He's an addict as well prescribed himself medications under my name, my brother's name, um, and he got caught doing that. So he got sent off to rehab. Um, and all I remember at that age was my mother crying every day, my dad being gone, you know, I was still a kid, and my brother just being angry and violent. Um, and that was a really hostile, it turned into a really hostile environment, and everything in my family kind of turned upside down, you know, uh, and fell apart. And, um, you know, my father... I couldn't admit it then. I couldn't admit it for many years, but like, yeah, I hated him for that. Um, you know, so any, <laughs> any normal picture of a family was kind of thrown out the window. Uh, and financially, you know, we kind of hit the dirt too because he spent, you know, he almost lost his license and we spent a lot of money sending him to rehab and he actually got sober and he's sober to this day. Um, and, and that's a miracle in itself. But when he came back, he, he moved out, he left my mom. You know, I'd go back and forth between the households. I hit puberty. I went to high school. I never felt like I fit in. Uh, I felt awkward. I saw friends that I had had my whole life. We went on different paths and went separate ways, and that was very painful. You know, I was just so uncomfortable with everything in life. And everything was so awkward, and uh, it was this big drama for me. You know, and it would make me feel physically ill, this, this anxiety that I had. And that's how I grew up, you know? so. Uh, when I found the first drink at like 13, it hit the spot, you know, and I knew about, from my father, I knew this was a family disease. I knew it could be passed down to other generations. I knew that I was at risk, um, but that didn't stop me. You know, my buddy brought over uh, a six pack and I remember, you know, I hated the taste. It made me want to throw up, but I drank all three because it felt really good. And, and, you know, that wasn't enough for me. And we went up and stole from my parents' liquor cabinet because I knew where the key was. And we stole a little bit from each bottle to hide the fact that we were stealing. You know, these are the patterns of behavior that would continue throughout my entire drinking and drugging career. Um, and, you know, I drank till I got alcohol poisoning and my friend held me over a trash can all night. I don't remember, I blacked out. I blacked out my first drunk. It's, it's so funny. Um, you know, and, and I lied to my mom the next day as to what was going on. My mother was an enabler, so I hung around her pretty close. My dad was sober. I kind of kept my distance. Um, you know, and that's how I grew up. And as I got into high school, you know, um, I sought out those types of environments, those people that wanted to party, you know, and then, then came the weed, you know, and, and I don't know where it came from, but I just, 
you know, I, I had this gravitation towards, hey, I want to try that, you know, and, and I couldn't drink and drive. I, I, I was like, eh, I don't really want to do that. I couldn't really drink and function in school because I had tried that and spilled vodka all over the gym floor uh, and almost got in trouble. Uh, so, you know, I found uh, weed and I started smoking a lot and I found people that wanted to smoke a lot. And that's what I did, you know, I drive around thinking it was all fun and games and, uh, you know, do some dumb stuff. And by my senior year, you know, it was um, uh, my junior year, actually, I started hanging out with seniors that would party. They're about to graduate and throw these huge parties, no parents, no adults. And I get drunk and, you know, and I just I I remember, you know, (laughs) not having that anxiety, that that social awkwardness, you know when I was drinking and partying in those situations. And then I remember the next morning I'd, with you know everyone waking up hungover, not feeling that way anymore and, and wanting, I, I wished I could stay in that kind of bliss. And uh, you know, it was so elusive, you, just, you couldn't grasp onto it. I never once got that original feeling back in the end. And um, uh, you know, I just remember kids coming up to me and going, hey, you know, cause I, I thought it was a badge of um, honor to be able to drink and drug the way I was doing it, you know, and I wanted kids to respect that did the same thing. So I remember kids would come up to me with a handful of pills and be like, hey, you got to try this. And I, I didn't even ask what it was. I would just take it, you know, and find out later it was a very high dose of something that could have really hurt me. Um, so that's what it was like. But again, I'm walking on eggshells and my father's in sobriety. You know, I'm still living under my parents' roof. Um, I got away with as much as I could. And when I went off to college, all bets were off. You know, I went down to SUNY Purchase down in Westchester County. And, uh, you know, I met a girl from Brooklyn down there and she showed me the city. Um, A lot of friends from the city, they showed me the bars you can get into underage. You know, uh, they were all kids that partied, smoked, drank, did drugs. And and those are the people I surrounded myself with immediately. And I didn't have to walk on eggshells anymore because my parents are three and a half hours upstate. you know, and I thought I had arrived, as, as Bill Wilson put it. Um, you know, so th- that's where I went with it, you know. And so I started partying and drinking more. Of course, I'm still smoking weed. And, um, you know, that kind of progressed. I got good grades first semester, second semester, show up hungover or high, uh, push through the day, get stuff done. You know, by my sophomore year, I had found cocaine and, um, you know, did a lot of that. And... Um, you know, my grades started falling off a little bit. I'd still show up, but they started falling off. And, you know, what I found is that with all my anxiety that I had to begin with, um, <laughs> the weed made me paranoid, the, the coke made me anxious, so I found Xanax and Klonopin and other pills that would calm those nerves, you know. So um, <laughs> that, that's how my disease progressed. And, and they say it's a progressive disease, and any period of time it gets worse, never better. And that was my experience, you know, just as the years rolled by, uh, things got progressively worse. And I was drinking more often, heavier, harder booze, harder drugs. And I remember my junior year, I went overseas and I lived in Spain for a semester and um, there was no drinking age really. So, and you could drink in the street. So I was like, this is great, you know. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna lay low though. You know, I'm gonna lay off the hard drugs, you know, And, and, and I, thought I could hold myself to that because I'm in a foreign country and I didn't really speak the language that well and I thought I could just avoid that and you know by like mid-semester I found someone who sold uh, cocaine met the guy he said you want some cocaine didn't know the guy didn't know what his deal was and I was like yeah he's like hop on my motorcycle I'm like okay you know and there I was going off across the city and completely free. he could have taken me to a dark alley and beat me and robbed me you know God knows man um And so I spent all my money. I spent thousands of dollars overseas. Um, I felt like shit about it. I drank literally every day on that trip. I don't think there was a day, even the days I was physically ill, like with a cold, still drank. If I went out, I drank. If I stayed in, I drank and uh, drugged, you know. And I remember there's a kid, they say that we're selfish. You know, our problem is that we're self-centered. There was a kid who had a huge problem with cocaine that I met over there. And because I didn't want to use alone, I dragged him into the bathroom with me and got him uh, doing lines with me. You know, that's, that's the kind of person I was because I didn't want to feel all alone. Um, you know, and I had burned a lot of bridges by the end of that trip with all the kids I studied with. Um, came back 
And, you know, growing up in a household, you know, my father was abusing opiates. And, um, you know, that was his drug of choice amongst many others. But so I knew I'm like, you know, even more, there's that voice inside of me that's not wrong, that tells me if something's off. And I knew going near those opiates would be would be a problem. Um, but I got back from overseas and I was like, man, I want to try. I want to try opiates. I want to take it to, I want to, what is that like? What's all this fuss over this stuff? And, uh, you know, I started buying pills off the street, you know, um, hydrocodone, um, you know, little shit off the street. And I started abusing that. And, um, you know, that progressed to Oxycontin and uh, eventually progressed to heroin. But so what was my typical day like in, in, in the heights of my addiction? It was, um, you know, I promised myself to like cool out for a couple of days. And by mid-afternoon, you know, I'd, I'd be rounded up my numbers on campus trying to call people, trying to, you know, just making a total ass of myself, trying to, trying to get whatever I wanted. You know, and it'd start with the weed, but I don't like the way the weed made me feel, and so I wanted an upper. So I'd get cocaine or Adderall or pills, and, but, you know, the anxiety. So I'd have to go then find Xanax, you know, and to top off the whole night, I would need to get some Oxycontin to, to settle my ass down. You know, and I spent a lot of my days, like by my senior year, my last year, I spent a lot of days just doing uppers all day and then doing Oxycontin the rest of the day. And a couple times I got really ill and just almost died. Um, you know, I just, I just remember like, like, please don't die, you know, like laying and not being able to get out of bed and not being able to stop vomiting. I, you know, I, I was spending so much money, any money I had on drugs and alcohol um, I had like maybe a plate of dry pasta a day, you know, that's, that's where that took me. And I was skipping out on rent and I was, you know, um, conning people for money. You know, the girlfriend I was with that same girl for like four or five years, um, she was, she was sick. She had, um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, very, she in and out of the hospital. She had it since she was young. And I remember stealing her pills out of her purse while she was in the next room. And that, that's where my disease brought me. You know, that's where this disease takes me. I don't, I don't think about anyone else. And once I put, you know, the first drug or drink in my body, all bets are off. I don't have a say anymore, you know, and I just hated that. I hated that feeling, um, you know, because I knew, I knew what I was doing was wrong. Um, I just didn't have a say in the matter anymore. It was complete insanity. Um, and so what came with that lifestyle was a lot of guilt, a lot of shame. Um, I was burning bridges, fucking people over. Stealing, um, lying. I mean, my life was a lie. I never once was honest with anyone. You know, I didn't know how to approach someone with my problems or talk about my problems or ask for help. Or, you know, I just, I lied to everyone. I was never honest. And I kept, so all that stuff was just festering inside of me. Um, you know, and so the guilt and the shame were there. Um, and then there was this self-loathing that just... You know, it, I just fertilized that my entire life. You know, I, I hated the person I was. You know, but again, I don't have that choice if I put a drink or a drug in my body. Um, but the self-loathing, you know, I, I, I never, I hated my father for what he did. And I never wanted to become, and there I was, a spitting image. You know, and that ate me alive inside. My, my fears, my, my anger, which I, I turned my anger on myself. That's, that's my MO. You know, I turn the anger inward and it becomes depression. That's the kind of person I am. Um, this stuff festered inside of me for years and I was powerless. You know, I wasn't willing to admit I was powerless. You know, denial is a big part of this thing. You know, I was in so much denial, you know, but it's that feeling in the pit of your stomach when you know something's wrong. You know, um, I just chose not to listen to it. I was the king of rationalization, uh, rationalizing my bad behavior, uh, this, the means by which I had to get, you know, whatever I wanted, um, yeah, I was just in so, so much denial. And, um, you know, by the end, people could see right through me. And I had run through so many circles on that college campus. You know, I wore out my welcome. I was hanging out with the other dope addicts on campus. Um, and, you know, what happened, it's funny, because, you know, after a while, the Oxycontin gets to be so fucking expensive. Um, and one day, they couldn't get any. So that's when I tried heroin. You know, it's the natural progression, I guess. And I never stuck needles in my arm, but that's, uh, that's what I did for a time. And so I failed out of college. Um, I stopped going to class completely. I was either withdrawing or in the city looking for drugs. 
in, in a in a bad place. And um, you know, I failed out of college. I spent like nine semesters and forty grand, and I failed. So my parents were like, "What the fuck are you doing down there? You know, if you're not getting a degree." Um, and I was like, "Well, I, I might be drinking too much. You know that. that you know that if." If an alcoholic or an addict tells you they have, what, three beers a day, you know, just multiply that times six, um, and you got your number. Um, you know, sa- same with drugs. So I came back upstate. My parents were like, we love you, but you're not staying with us. My dad knew what I was doing. You know, he didn't confront me. He didn't push me around. He just, he knew. Um, he had been there. My mom was an enabler still. They booted me out. They said, we love you. We will pay for you to go see an addiction psychiatrist. And I was like... You know, I was desperate, and um, I was like, okay, you know, trying to get them off my back and try to make things work, and I, uh, I started seeing her, and after a while, you know, she's just brutally honest, cut, cut through the bull crap, she doesn't mince her words, you know, um, and she called me out on all my shit, and I, I hated it, and I just kept using, you know, and um, this, this is the kind of insanity, you know, insanity doing the same thing over and over again, and expecting different results. Um, you know, I used to get paid on a Friday. And I knew no one up here that, that would sell opiates. So, and I knew people in the city. So I used to get out of work at 4. And I knew I had my check. So I would drive right away down to Poughkeepsie I would, for two hours. I would take a train into Grand Central Station. You know, kind of check out and see how many policemen are on duty. How many you know, police dogs. I would take the six train downtown um, or the A train to Brooklyn and uh, get what I needed to get, you know, hang out just long enough to make, it was a kid from college, just, just long enough to make it seem like I wasn't using this person, which I was. And um, buy as much as I could with my check. I would uh, go back uptown, dodge policemen in Grand Central Station, get on my train and basically pass out. And, and by the time I got back to my car in Poughkeepsie, it was like two in the morning. So I'd be driving up 87, you know, nodding off. And um, <laughs> I didn't fucking crash, you know, or, or kill someone else or kill myself or get pulled over with a bag full of fucking her- you know, heroin or Oxycontin, you know, it's beyond me. Um, but that's the kind of stuff I did. That's where this disease took me. And um, man, that's exhausting. You know, and you, you guys know, it's, that's fucking exhausting. Excuse my language. Um, and I did that for a long time. And eventually my addiction psychiatrist, somehow I was still going to see her. Uh, I'd go like every couple weeks. And she's like, you got to cut off the bullshit. She said, if you want to keep coming back to talk to me, you're going to have to stop drinking, stop drugging. But she always suggests go to AA, go to a meeting, go to whatever, but go. And go at least five days a week. And something inside of me got really scared. And, um, you know, like it was the last kind of stop for me. And um, I knew where this thing could take me. And so I stopped for almost, almost a year. I, I was so sick for so long. You know, going, going through like getting out of that, you know, the, the physical sickness, the mental sickness, the spiritual sickness, the emptiness I felt when I was withdrawing. You know, I just didn't want to move. I don't, I don't want to, I wouldn't do shit, you know. And it was just like a void, just one big void inside of me. And I wanted to die. Um, I really wanted to die. Um, didn't have a plan, but I did. Um, you know, so I managed to, like, almost a year I was dry. And by the end of that time, I had discovered, <laughs> I had discovered um, Kratom. I was like, oh, it's, you know, it's in smoke shops. I can take this. Like, I'm sober. You know, I like the way this thing makes me feel, but it's, it's legal. So there's nothing wrong with that, you know. And I did that. I abused that for, like, two years. And, and that was even more expensive than OxyCon. Spent all my money. You know, I was hopelessly in debt. I had speeding tickets galore. Um, court dates I was skipping. Uh, I was putting a dollar in my gas tank to get around town. Uh, but, but I was sober. You know, I was sober. And... Um, Man, what a painful experience. Uh, but again, I was so good at rationalizing that kind of stuff. And, and where did that leave me? You know, that <laughs> I remember like at the end of the day, no matter how much I did, uh, I couldn't get high anymore. And um, that, so I, I just remember sitting there one day and on the package it said, don't take with alcohol. So I was like, I'm going to the liquor store. 
you know, and, and, and I was back into the pills, back into the drugs, and back into drinking like that, you know. Um, but I was sober. Um, and everyone else thought I was sober too. So I was, I was living one more lie. Um, you know, and that's, I did that for maybe another few months. And I don't know what broke me. Um, I think it was the fact that I couldn't, you know, even with the booze, pills, you know, everything, I, I couldn't get high anymore. And uh, I could no longer escape that pain. And, um, you know, that kind of bottomed me out. I was at it. It was funny because, like, I didn't get arrested. I was close, but I didn't get arrested and I didn't die. Um, but my bottom was like a spiritual bottom, you know. And there was just, like, glimpses of, like, there's got to be more to life. And, like, how, how did I become this person? You know, I, I hated looking in the mirror. Um, but how did I become this person? Like, where, where the fuck did I take a wrong turn, you know, and I'd see other people like living their lives on Facebook or pictures of them happy, smiling, and it just, it just tore me apart inside, you know, and, and my entire life, you know, it was like, it was that battle going on inside of me, you know, the inner voice that, that knows, and, and like the, the addict and the alcoholic, and it was just a constant tug of war, um, you know, so my insides were all screwed up, um, you know, and I broke down and, you know, I was still going to see this woman. And so, the first, you know, I spent a lifetime avoiding my father and he was the first person I called when I, when I truly bottomed out um, or, or got to a place where I was willing to kind of surrender. And he didn't yell at me. He didn't lecture. I was always so afraid of him. He didn't yell at me. He didn't lecture me. He didn't tell me what to do. He just laughed and he's like, yeah, I know. I did the same thing. And that, my mind was blown. Um, I was like, well, what do I do? He's like, well, one day at a time. And I can't do one day at a time. He's like, well, 10 minutes at a time, five minutes. You know, I was just sick as a dog. Um, you know, just the, the obsession was there. Um, but I found meetings, you know, instead of making excuses, I found meetings that I could go to every day. I went to a meeting every single day. I went to the gym because I was like 225 pounds. I was a lot bigger, heavier. It was all belly too. Um, I went to the gym, I went to meetings, I went to work, and I went home. And, um, you know, I kept seeing this addiction psychiatrist, you know. And I got like 100 days and went back out. And, you know, when I came back, you know, I, I was like, do I come back and just lie and not tell anyone? And I'm like, well, that's, you know. I knew my, my path to recovery and happiness and well-being couldn't be done through lies. I had heard enough in the rooms to know that this is a program of honesty. And so I came back and was honest with everybody in my life and, and my psychiatrist and the people in the rooms and my sponsor. And I restarted the steps, um, which I didn't make it that far anyways. Um, and that was the turning point for me. You know, that, that was when I truly surrendered. And, you know, I would hear stuff in these rooms and, and my sponsor would tell me stuff or show me stuff in our book um, that just turned on the lights. You know, it was the darkness my entire life and the lights would come on. You know, and what I know that as today is a spiritual experience. Um, whether it was big or small, they all, I just had so many spiritual experiences starting to unfold. And this had come at a time when he told me to pray. You wake up and you get on your knees and you pray. And I had no idea what I was praying to, no idea what I was doing. I didn't want to pray, but I was desperate and I did it. And I did it daily and my life started to change. And I started doing the four step and, you know, I felt like crap looking at, you know, my resentments, my fears, my sexual misconduct and my harms done others. I didn't want to, I spent a lifetime running from that. Why would I ever sit down and write it all out and sit, sit with that? Um, you know, and I didn't have drugs and alcohol to numb the pain anymore. Um, you know, so that was excruciating. Um, but I kept pushing through and it wasn't like taking a shot or, or, um, you know, taking some pills or doing some drugs. It wasn't that like, oh, I feel better. No, it, it was like a slow process where, where I started to just kind of unfold. And, um, you know, still working with a psychiatrist. And she tore me to pieces. Man, I used to dread going down there every time. But she opened my eyes. And the allegory I like to use is, is Plato's allegory of the cave. You know, there's, there's in this allegory, this couple guys chained up facing a wall. And behind them is a fire. So upon the wall, all they see is their shadows. They can't turn their head. They can't look anywhere else. They don't see each other, just their shadows. So their entire existence are their own shadows on the wall. 
that's all they know. And until one day someone breaks free um, of the chains and he turns around and he sees there's a fire that casts a shadow on the wall. Um, and, and that just blows and he can't accept that for a long time. But he finally comes to accept that and eventually leaves the cave into the greater world around him and, and discovers, you know, what, what life is um, in the greater world. You know, his, his entire existence was so small, you know, and um, after a long time, and, and, you know, it took him so long to accept, and it was painful, and it made him sick to see, you know, he accepted that and, you know, came to understood that and returned to the cave and tried to explain that to the other guys still chained up, and they all laughed at him, you know, and that is a parallel to my my spiritual awakening in this program, so to speak, to me working the steps, a program of action, to me changing who I am, because it wasn't enough for me to just stop drugging and stop drinking. Um, you know, and, and often, the, and, and I say that allegory too, because often the most painful things in my recovery um, and the most awkward things and, and the things I didn't want to do were the things that helped me the most. And that continues to be the case in, in in my sobriety, you know, being honest, it's usually not easy if I owe someone honesty or if I lied or lied by omission, which is another form of lying where I leave details out, um, you know, and, and usually the right thing to do for me is, is, is hard. Um, but it gets easier as I, as I go down that road and I start to build something which I never understood and never had it, which is self-esteem. You know, and, and they told me if I want self-esteem to start doing esteemable things. Um, you know, so, you know, the fourth step and getting through the fourth step, I finally sat down. You know, I finished it. I had all the work done and I still put off meeting with my sponsor for the fifth step. And I finally did that. And I remember things I had kept in my entire life. You know, he would laugh and I'd be like, why are you laughing? And he's like, because I did the same thing. And I'm the same way. He wouldn't say, I, yeah, I was like that too. He's like, no, I'm the same way. You know, present tense. He's like, yeah, this is how I get through it. You know, I catch it here and I catch it there. And this is what I do. And this, you know, this really helped me. And again, the lights were turned on. And, um, you know, I, I started, you know, we are building, as it says in the book, we are building the arch under which we'll walk a free man. You know, and before we are halfway through, um, we will know a new freedom and a new happiness. And we will be amazed before we're halfway through. And I was, and I proceeded, and I, you know, I got to the amends. And, and again, I balked uh, because who wants to go and admit their faults to someone they haven't talked to in maybe three years or people they know and, and just admit their faults and their dishonesty? You know, and I realized I had the hardest time with it, and I realized why I didn't want to do it because then I could no longer play my bullshit game with my persona. You know, I had this image I spent a lifetime constructing of myself, how I wanted people to see me. And by laying myself honestly before someone, I was blowing that image to smithereens. That's what I learned is humility. You know, um, and, and humility I learned from that. And again, the most painful amends, the, the heaviest phone calls I had to make ended up being a blessing. And, um, you know, I had... Uh, I had so many spiritual experiences. And a lot of people were like, dude, I don't even remember that. I dreaded these phone calls. And, and people were like, I don't even remember that, dude. Um, and I spent years holding on to it. And uh, other people were like, dude, I love you. Like, I just hope you're well. I'm like, wow. Like, wow, dude, I carried that around for so long. You know, so the relief and, and the spiritual experience that I had was just incredible. You know, my that girlfriend I told you about, um, one of my living amends was to to not procrastinate anymore because my grandfather had died before I could make amends. And, um, you know, that, that girlfriend I had for all those years, um, I, I found out she had cancer. So I called her, like, I put her, she was last on the list. I put her first on the list, part of the living amends. And, um, you know, I called her and reached out to her and I did my part and she died like two months later. Um, you know, <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't want a drug. I didn't want to drink. You know, I was sad and confused and kind of angry. And then, um, you know, the stages of grief and then there was acceptance at the end of that road. Um, you know, and, you know, there's a difference between crying and weeping. I learned that weeping is out of joy. You know, it's so like, I get a little teary about this now, but it's, it's joy, you know. Um, because just, just everything. 
poorly wrapped gifts. You know, you see how everything comes together. And, and back at the time, it's like, this is a, a nightmare. Well, I will never get through this. And, you know, here I am today, you know, over three years of sobriety. And um, it's unbelievable to me, you know. Um, and, and what has come with this sobriety? You know, I couldn't leave my house or open my mail or answer my phone or handle my finances. I mean, that's a, that's a laugh. Um, you know, and, and what have I been given today? I mean, the, the material things are one thing. You know, I have a job. Um, you know, I got, I got my EMT certification for New York State um, in my sobriety. I, uh, you know, I work in an ER and I work with other adults and sick people. And, and there's often a lot of tension and anger and fear in this environment because people are afraid. And I'm able to use this program to help guide me in these affairs. And, you know, I started hiking and I started doing martial arts and I lost a bunch of weight. Like these are all, you know, these all followed my spiritual progress in the program. The spiritual progress had to come first, you know, and I'm work in progress. Let me tell you, you know, um, because I still experience fear, um, self-doubt. Um, you know, sometimes I experience low self-esteem still. Um, but God, as I understand God, you know, in that relationship, with all the stories I told you, that relationship with a higher power has just developed and developed and developed. And it is, it is a rather warm embrace today. Um, and I continue to practice these spiritual um, principles and, and pray and work with others. You know, I sponsor um, four guys right now. And... Um, my life is full. You know, I have to do these things on a daily basis. Because if I don't, I wake up in the morning and I forget all about this. You know, that's why it's so great to be up here to, to remind me of where I come from. Because I'll forget, you know. And um, I got to give back, you know. And my problem is that I'm self-centered, you know. And, and I go back to that on a daily, a morning basis. You know, every morning. Back to like, my worst days are like thinking about Josh, 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 Josh. It's, it's enough to drive me nuts. And. You know, luckily my habit now is not to pick up a drink it's to, or a drug, it's to pick up the phone and call my sponsees or call another alcoholic or get involved, get out, you know, smile at someone, hold the door. I saw an old man in Stewart's the other day, um, fairly old, buying coffee, and I, and I snuck across the counter and, and paid for his coffee and ran out of there. You know, it felt, it felt great. It felt so good. Um, you know, so... You know, it's a daily, daily thing for me. Um, but at the end of the day, I just have so much gratitude. And, um, you know, what a blessing it is to be alive. You know, and, and you get that all the time. Like, I used to get, I got this A, B, and C, and I used to bitch to my sponsor about all these problems. He's like, hey, did you wake up today? I'm like, you know, reluctantly, yeah. What the fuck does that have to do with it, you know? And he said, did you drink? I'm like, no. He's like, that's a good day, man. And, you know, I didn't believe it at the time, but you hear that enough. You know, I had to hear all these positive things. And, you know, I have to talk nice to myself, too. You know, my life is built on negativity and deception. And so on a daily basis, I now, you know, I love myself. I can say that today. And um, I say nice things to myself. And, uh, you know, try to put myself out there. And I just keep having spiritual experience after spiritual experience. Often through difficult and painful situations still. Um, Okay. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you guys for letting me share. Josh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.